Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. All right. Let's get the service started with a video. This was a bad idea. There are no Easter carols like at Christmas. There's no way this is going to work. On the Sunday of Easter, my Savior gave to me a neighbor sitting in church with me. <laughs> We are going around the neighborhood singing Easter carols to invite people like you to join people like us for Easter Sunday morning services. Yep, and Dave here thought it was a good idea for us to dress as Easter characters. It was a committee decision. Anywho, <laughs> this Easter we have some of your favorite memorable characters, like the guard at the tomb. Do that soldier thing. Surely this man was the son. Tell him who I am. Tell him. 
seemed pretty self-explanatory. Did it? Because your text read, and I quote, wear a pilot costume. I did not mean an airline pilot. I meant pilot, the Roman governor, who had a pivotal scene with Jesus when it came to the crucifixion. Would you like to come to Easter services with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm pilot. Pilot, washing my hands. I will have nothing to do with this innocent man. Yeah. <laughs> and I am Malchus. I am a servant of the high priest Calliope. Nobody knows who Malchus is. Um, and I was in the Garden of Gethsemane when Peter cut off my ear. <laughs> oh, we're losing them. Okay. Oh, 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 one, two, and a three. Just yeah, sit right, right back, back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a sacrifice. sacrifice. He, he rode into Jerusalem and Peter denied him thrice. <laughs> Please join us for Easter. <laughs> All right, that happened. <laughs> so if you ever have nightmares of a donkey dancing, you know who to blame. <laughs> Love you, Steve. All right, let's get to the announcements. So there's actually, uh, there will be a Bible study this week, men's Bible study tomorrow at Monday. But for the rest of the week, there are no Bible studies. Uh Moving on. Uh, what in the world? Okay, I guess I need glasses now. Good Friday service. It is this Friday, not Wednesday, as the slide said, on Friday, 6.30 p.m. And also on Friday, starting Friday, is a 24-hour prayer vigil. We actually had 72 people sign up. 72. That is more than we ever had. That's awesome. But, there, but the sign-ups are still up there. They're still opening, uh, open spots, so please sign up for it. It's going to be great. Uh, Saturday, this Saturday, is men's coffee at 7.30 a.m. And Sunday, March 31st, uh, the early service for Resurrection Sunday is here at 7.30 a.m. And at 8.30, there's going to be food. Star that one. And then 9.30 is the Resurrection Sunday service. So please come and please invite people. There is no greater message that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There's no greater message. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, if you want to make us food, really good food, if you're a good cook, you are obligated. <laughs> Sign up <laughs> and make us some great food. <laughs> All right. Uh, tonight at 6 p.m., uh, Sunday night preaching continues, this time with Larry Spore, wherever he's sitting at. There he is, man in the back. <laughs> He'll be preaching tonight. And... Uh, Communion prep, communion prep. So if you would like to help us, this is a ministry you can do. It's a, it's a monthly thing. There's sign-ups to all you have to do is to prepare communion for a Sunday. So you'll have to do it four times a month. That's it. If you want to help with that, that would be great. And then on the wall coming up, it's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a sheet about Marilyn Nathaniel Melchek's baby shower. And I got some inside scoop the other day. They're, they're going to name the baby after me. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be Joshua or Joshika. <laughs> if you value your lives, do not name your baby Joshua. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that is it. So let us please stand. As we begin our service with prayer, let's pray. Lord, Master, we do love you. It's tremendous that you rose from the dead. And it's amazing to me, Lord, that there's so much evidence for it. I try to disprove it, and it's just so much evidence that you rose from the dead. And since you rose from the dead, our eternities with you is assured that we will go to heaven one day to be with you and to be with each other forever. Lord, I'm so looking forward to it. I'm so thankful for it. You are an amazing God. It's pray, Lord, we will worship you with all that we are, that we'll prepare our hearts for communion, and the message today will assimilate us to you, to your character, and we can spread that message to the world. It's your name, Lord, that I pray. Amen. This morning's service will begin differently. I'd like to begin by reading from the Gospel of Luke, 
starting in uh, chapter 19, verses 28 to 31. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Please be seated. This is a no-brainer. We do exactly what Jesus said. We go into town, we find the donkey with its coat. I and just don't understand it. why Jesus wants us to commit a crime. He wants us to steal a donkey. No, no. Not steal, borrow. Oh, so we're just supposed to stroll into town, untie the donkey, and... And say exactly what he said to say. Oh, what is it? Oh, that the Lord has need of it? Yes, and we'll return it. What does that even mean, the Lord has need of it? It's self-explanatory. Why are you being so, so... So, so, so me? Because you all know that I'm the rule follower of the bunch. I just don't know why Jesus just didn't ask Peter to do this. Yeah. I'm thinking the same thing. This is so up Peter's alley. Steal the donkey, cause an uproar, that's his thing. Peter is the reason why banks chain their pens. Oh, I just don't want to go to jail. You know I hate one ply toilet paper. I lower your voice. What? Look, we're just going to do what Jesus says. What's the worst that can happen? Oh, what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? I don't know, a cracked rib, a busted lip, the kind of name calling that'll put you in therapy years down the road? Stop it! Stop whining! Stop talking! Stop everything! Stop freaking out! Um, I, I, I don't mean to be judgy here, but someone needs to get the log out of their own eye. You have trust issues. Serious trust issues. You even know how many germs are in a jail cell, do you? No, 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 I don't, I don't. I'm sure it's a whole lot, okay? I don't know. And I don't know why Jesus wants us to get a donkey, and I don't know why people are gathering branches over here and lining the streets, but it just seems like there's something big is about to happen. Wait a minute. Yeah. Go back. Why did you say I had trust issues? Okay. Okay, let's make it about you. What? Think about it. Since we've been following him, we've seen him give sight to the blind. He's healed people with leprosy. He's raised people from the dead. From the dead? I can't even raise you from a nap. <laughs> hey, I think we can trust him with this donkey issue. I just did. I have trust issues. I see how Jesus trusts the Father. He trusts so much, even more than the ground that I'm standing on. To trust someone like that, I, I, I just can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. But if you're going to trust someone, that's him, right? Oh. <sighs> Okay, all right, let's do it. We got this. Huh? You first. Baby steps. Hey, when we get there and we grab said donkey, maybe I really should leave like a Benjamin. No. A 20 spot? No. A thank you card. Stop it. All right, I'll trust him. Please stand with me as we read responsively this morning. <clears throat> as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set off for Jerusalem. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's go. 
up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O oh Lord my God. Glory to the King of Kings. morning church so I'll start by ushering the sentiments of Mike Kripe by saying we are a giving church <clears throat> what you decide to give financially is between you and God just as Mike would say our building fund is strong our mission support is strong and our giving matches or is better than the monthly church budget so I'll focus on our talents and gifts that we can offer the church Isaiah 6 verse 8, and 1 Samuel, the entire chapter 3. So Isaiah 6, 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. 1 Samuel 3, 8 through 10 specifically says, A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. 
Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. These verses are the basis for the song, Here I Am, Lord. Here I Am is one of my favorite offering songs because it's all about what you can do for our Lord. God is all powerful, which makes it possible for him to do whatever he wants regardless of what we offer back, but he gives us a chance to serve him. How will you serve him? The church can use help in the nursery, the young kids ministry, the older kids ministry. You can choose to be discipled, help with the building and grounds, IT. How can you share your skills with the church? Will you please pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for all that you have allowed us to be stewards of. We have nothing but what you allow us. So thank you. I pray you I pray we honor you by directing our funds so that we spread your word and each of us answer the calling and share our talents with the church. I pray for comfort for those on our prayer list and I pray for guidance for our church leadership and the leaders of our country. Lord, in these things we pray, amen. Well, the only issue I got with that first film, I got to correct it. We never allow our donkeys to dance in the front yard. <laughs> Backyard only. I know this kind of looks odd. He was like, wow, this is like looking into the future, 40 years into the future. Sean and Dax. <laughs> Do I have to use that box? <laughs> no, I, I don't have to use the box. <laughs> Neither does Dax anymore. And I'm sure Sean's saying, I'm still praising the Lord from the pulpit 40 years from now. Dax saying, I still got hair. <laughs> but we want to start today with uh, news. I can't watch the news anymore. There's nothing but lies. They want to tell you what they believe the truth is, but their truth serves men's lust for power, greed, and control. But we all know here that the only truth is in the truth of God's word. So we're going to start with Matthew 28, 17 through 29. Come on up here so we can hear you. On the first day of the festival, 
of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go to, into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When the evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, <clears throat> The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will will go just as, a, as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays <clears throat> the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now, on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we can gather here in unity. Thank you so much for your sacrifice that allows us to have the opportunity to be with you in heaven. We ask that you bless everyone here today and that strengthen us through the sermons and, and through your spirit to go out and spread the good word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks, dude.
page number 597. If you want to turn to that, hold that and ready. The kids are dismissed to go downstairs. I have to tell you, speaking of kids, it's really good to see the father-son teams get up here. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is good. And, you know, I've, I've struggled with something for the last several weeks, and that is, how do you say thank you to somebody who they really don't want to be thanked? How do you acknowledge somebody that, that really don't care to be acknowledged? And Dan, you presented the perfect opportunity for me to do this. I don't know if you've noticed that we have a new sign out front. Um, and so Ray, Dan's father here, Ray and his family were the ones who, man, they did all the work. The permits, meeting with the sign company. So um, we'll acknowledge them who don't want to be acknowledged. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for your generosity and your foresight to, uh, to put that in. We, we do appreciate that. And thank you, Dan, for bringing them up here to give me this opportunity. Um, it's good to be back with you. Um, we're glad to be back. We're glad to leave the 70 degree weather to come back to the 30. <laughs> Sunshine to come back to the snow, but it, it is good back to be back. We had a good trip, no incidents. It was there and back and that was good. So it's good to be back. There's a couple things I wanna point out. Josh mentioned a couple of the things. Uh, you'll notice in your bulletin, it says Resurrection Weekend Prayer Guide. This is just a suggested thing for you to use as uh, you pray this weekend. And for those of you who were not able to sign up or didn't think you could sign up, you have now the copy of the prayer guide. So if you want to use that, uh, you don't need, we don't need any acknowledgement of who you are. Just use it uh, because we, uh, we do believe in prayer. And so use that uh, this weekend. The other thing is you'll notice on the back of your bulletin, it says Wednesday night Bible study, Core 52. This is the book called Core 52. Uh, it was written by a guy that I was in school with, Mark Moore, but it's a unique book. It says, a 15-minute daily guide to build your Bible IQ in a year. And so what he's done is he's tried to go back and find the 52 most significant verses of the Bible. And uh, he's put together a, uh, a book each week as one of those verses. And then during the week, you have the opportunity to do, he has suggested things for you to do each week to increase your Bible knowledge. We're gonna use this on Wednesday night, but this is a study that uh, we encourage everybody, whether you can come to Wednesday night or not, to get this book. We've ordered uh, 12 or so of them, so we have some copies available, but if you have access to Amazon or those type of things, you can buy it yourself, or there's a website called Core 52, and you can get it from there. But anyhow, we're going to use this book in the next 52 weeks or so. That's what we're going to do on Wednesday night. So you can follow along with us if you want to buy the book and uh, each week follow the lesson. So I just wanted to announce that, especially for those of you who do come on Wednesday night, go ahead and get your copy of this and you can go ahead and start on chapter one, the first lesson. So you'll be good to go when we get together. April 3rd is when we're starting this, April 3rd. So I just wanted to make mention of that. Um, and if you want a copy, if you can't get online, if you're one of those people who hate technology and you can't get online, we'll have copies available. Just let myself or Janice know and we'll get you a copy. So I think that's all I needed to say. All right, our invitation hit one now. Oh, April Fool's, I guess. All right, well, let's look at uh, the scripture conveniently for you as printed on the front of the bulletin, Matthew 21. We're going to read through that again. So if you'd stand with me as we honor God and his word, we're going to talk about uh, the triumphal entry, entry the, this whole idea of, of uh, this, this important Sunday. It says this, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt tied by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what is spoken through the prophet. Say to the, to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their coats on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their coats on the road while cut others cut palm leaves from trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that follow shouted, Hosanna to, son, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest in heavens. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazarene in Galilee. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be together today, to look at your word, to be encouraged through the presence of one another here. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity now to study. And we pray, Father, that as we look at these words written and spoken so many years ago, that we might see the significance and the importance of them for our lives even today. So, Father, I pray that you would be with us as we study, and we'll thank you for this. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, I love a parade. Most people do. A little boy was sick on Palm Sunday and he stayed home from church with his mother. His father returned from church holding a palm branch. The little boy was curious and asked, what did you, why do you have that palm branch, Dad? Well, you see, said Dad, when Jesus came into town, everyone waved palm branches to honor him. So we got a palm branch at church today. The little boy replied, not really understanding. Oh, shucks, he said. The one Sunday I miss is the Sunday that Jesus shows up. <laughs> well, the sad reality is, is that Jesus is here and many today will miss him. He's not very far. He's here, but many, the sad truth is, will miss him. Everybody loves a parade. Uh, you know, it's no different in Jesus' day. Josephus, a Jewish historian, estimated that the crowd in Jerusalem that weekend, that week that Jesus was there and rode into the city, was estimated to be about 3 million people. That's a lot when the average uh, uh, population of Jerusalem was only about 200,000. The Sunday before Easter is called Palm Sunday, and rightly so, because in John 12, 13, we read that they broke palm leaves, branches from trees, and lined the streets in front of Jesus as he made his important entry into Jerusalem. You know, much of Jesus' life was spent alone. It was spent in a small group of, of people. But this is one of those moments where Jesus was out in public. This was one of those moments where his earthly ministry that had been for the most part private was now out in public at one of the most popular hours. And we read on this occasion that the people's question was, who is this? They asked that question because they didn't know. They really didn't know who this was. The occasion of Palm Sunday took place one week before his resurrection from the grave. While in the little village of Bethpage, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, go into the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just tell them the Lord has need of it and they will send them right along. Well, they did as they were instructed and they brought the little donkey. They put their garments on the donkey. Jesus sat upon the little animal Jesus rides down the side of the hill through the mount, uh, over Mount Olives. He goes through the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes through the Golden Gate on the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem. Down the street he goes, multitudes pack the, the, the sides of the street, and they cry out in verse 10, they cry out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the highest, when Jesus entered the city, the whole city was astir, and they said, who is this? And the response came back, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. The Pharisees, according to John, stood back observing all of these things. And this was their response. See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Oh, how I wish their words were true. Ah, oh, how I wish the Pharisees were right. Oh, how I wish the whole world indeed would go after Jesus. But the reality is, for today, many in that day, many in our day, miss Jesus. This is the beginning of Jesus' last week of ministry. 
packed into six days before he rises from the dead, there will be some of the greatest events that have ever taken place on earth. During this time, Jesus will institute the Lord's Supper that teaches his blood atonement, his death on Calvary. It teaches and re reminds us of his second coming. During the next few days, you will see him under an old olive tree, perhaps laying prostrate on a stone in the moonlight the night before his death, asking the question, oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. The travail of his soul will be so intense that blood will ooze from the pores of his skin. It's during this week that you will see the blackest hand of human history. You'll see a man that will dip his hand into a, a bowl with Jesus and hear Jesus say, what thou doest, do quickly. And for 30 pieces of silver, which was the common price of a slave, Jesus is betrayed. It's during this week that you will see the greatest farce of justice that the world has ever known. You will see Jesus undergo two separate trials, a religious trial and a civil trial, both of which go down in the annals of human history as the greatest injustice ever committed on the face of the earth. It's in this six-day period that follows his triumphal entry into this city that he will be taken and numbered among the thieves with a heavy cross laid across his back, he will drag that to Calvary. On that little barren skull-shaped hill, he will be lifted up between heaven and earth, robed in blood, crowned with thorns. It's during this next week that the most important thing will happen. The stone will be rolled away, the scepter that held the blessed body of Jesus. He will rise and neatly fold those grave clothes, placing them where he had laid and triumphantly walk out of that tomb, demonstrating victory over death, victory over hell, victory over the grave. The triumphal entry of Jesus Christ begins the greatest week in all of human history. And we ask ourselves, what is the significance? What is the purpose of Palm Sunday? What is the purpose of this triumphant entry? Well, I believe that we can nail it down to at least four pertinent purposes that I think we need to consider today. The first of those purposes is the coronation of a king. That's the first thing I see demonstrated here. 500 years before this, Jesus, 500 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Zechariah took his prophetic pen and wrote this about the Messiah, that he would come riding on a donkey in the midst of a city of thousands, of, of hundreds that will be cheering and praising him. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey. Matthew simply tells us that he, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. As far as Jesus' earthly ministry was concerned, this was his coronation as a king. It was prophesied that this event would take place and Jesus carefully saw that everything that was supposed to be fulfilled concerning him literally came to pass. Of course, though, the crowd had a choice. Because of the gift of free will, the crowd had a choice. Jesus did everything he could do. He made sure that everything was in place and everything was fulfilled. But the crowd had a choice. Jesus had prepared for this day. Jesus had prepared for this time as much as he could. He prepared. Everything was right. Everything was perfect. Everything was as it should be. Jesus made sure of that. But the crowd had a choice. And the same crowd who cried, hail him, one day, would soon be crying out, nail him. And that really was one of the purposes of this day. You see, on this day, God presents his very best. God presents his very finest. On this day, God presents his one and only. This event gave the crowds the opportunity to proclaim Jesus their king. This scene gives this 
crowd the opportunity to proclaim and declare Jesus Christ their King. See, what's the purpose of Palm Sunday? I believe the purpose of Palm Sunday is God saying to us, as He said in Matthew 17 and verse 5, This is My Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. I believe Palm Sunday is, is, is God saying to us, as Paul wrote in Philippians 2.9, Therefore God exalted Him to the highest place and gave Him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Listen, you were made for a king. You were created for a king. You were created to bend your knee. And you have a decision, a choice, as to who you will bow to. Every day, we bow to a king. Some bow to the king of self. Self-interest, self-indulgence, self-interest. Self Every day, we're, we're faced with a choice. And many choose self. Some bow to the king of things, and they've got all the latest things. They've got all the latest gadgets, and, and their garage is full of stuff that they will never, ever use. They bow to the king of things. Some people bow to the king of achievement, and they own every Tony Robbins tape that was ever made, and every positive outlook tape. It's all about accomplishing this or that. Listen, you were made for a king. You were made to bow your knee. I mean, can you see it? Can you see it? I invite you today to bow your knee to Jesus. I mean, can you see Him there in the crowd? Hundreds, thousands of people perhaps, young and old alike. Can you hear the excitement? Can you hear the laughter? Can you hear the loud voices waving hands, waving those palm branches, throwing palm leaves in the road, throwing their very coats into the roads? Can you see it? Now look again. Can you see yourself in that crowd? Because you're there. You're there by virtue of the choice that you have to make today. You're there by virtue of the eternal decision that you must make. You were made for a king. And the question is, what king will you bow to? Today, today will you bow? To King Jesus. You see, you say, what's the purpose of, of Palm Sunday? It's God presenting His very best and giving you the choice once again as to who you will bow to. Well, there's a second purpose of Palm Sunday that was foreshadowed here, and that is I've called the cross and the king. Yes, Jesus was a king, and as a king, He would wear a crown. But this time, the crown would not be a royal diadem crown, but it would be a crown made of cruel, large, inch and a half thorns that grew in that region. Long before Palm Sunday. You see, Jesus had told His disciples in Matthew 16, 21, from that time on, He began to explain to them that He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and on the third day rise again. And so here He is, this crowd, and they've seen Jesus produce bread out of thin air. They've seen Jesus heal the sick. They've seen, just recently, they've seen Him raise Lazarus from the dead just a few days before this. And word is spreading quickly that Jesus has the ability to bring life back to those who have died. And you know what they did? You know what that crowd wanted? They wanted a king who could provide food. They wanted a king who could prevent people from getting sick. They wanted a king who could prevent people from dying, and if you didn't die, he'd just raise you back to life. They wanted a king who could come in and defeat the Romans and relieve them of the heavy taxation of the Roman government. And this was the one. This was Jesus, the one. And so they cried out, Hosanna! You know what that means? To save. To save. That's what the crowd wanted. They wanted saving from the Romans. They wanted saving from sickness. They wanted saving from having to wake up on Monday morning and go to work. They wanted saving from the, from the boring routine of life. And if you do that for us, Jesus, we'll make you our king. And so here, 
and all the crowd. Here are the disciples. And Jesus has just said to them, I'm going to Jerusalem not to be made a king, not to, to be celebrated, not to lead in some insurrection. I'm going to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. That's what he made clear to them. And yet on this occasion, every one of them forgot those words. The multitude wanted to claim Jesus a king for various reasons. They wanted to make him a king, but not once did the disciples step up and say, hey, this isn't why he's here today. He's not here today to be your bread king. He's not here to be your, your health savior. He's here to die for the sins of the world. Not one disciple stood up and said that. You see, the purpose of Palm Sunday, here it is. The purpose of Palm Sunday is God's presenting to the world the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. The purpose for Jesus going to Jerusalem was to die on a cross for the sins of the world. This was Jesus' message to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who approached him one night in John chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus said to him, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may, be, may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And again in John chapter 12, he emphasizes the very same thing. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Listen, if you don't get anything else out of today, get this. Jesus wanted to die for you. Jesus wanted to die for you. I mean, if you were the only sinner, if you were the only one who needed salvation in this world, if you were the only man or woman who had ever sinned and needed a Savior, Jesus would have come and done what He did in order to save you. Listen. Jesus want, wanted to die for you. Jesus wanted to die for, say your name. Jesus wanted to die for, say your name. He wanted to die for you. You know, Matthew chapter 26 records an inter interesting story about Gethsemane. In Matthew 26 and verse 39, it says, Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Now, most of us have heard that, that uh, what Jesus was saying there is that Jesus really didn't want to go to the cross, that, that he was saying in, those, in that moment, God, if there's a plan B, let's do that. I have never liked that interpretation of this event that it's taken place because it's so out of character for Jesus. You say, okay, then, then what was Jesus saying? Now, I know we're delving into my opinion, and that's fine. I'm going to give you my opinion to make a point, okay? Understand that. But you say, what was Jesus saying? Well, in verse 38, the verse right before 39, it says, Then Jesus said to them, My soul is his anguish with sorrow, get this, to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. See, I don't believe that that's a figurative statement. I mean, we use it all the time. You know, I, we work hard out in the yard and we say, boy, I'm about to die, but we don't mean it. I think this is not a figurative statement. I think this is a literal statement. I believe Jesus was literally dying in the garden. Luke says that, that there were great sweat drops of blood that were coming uh, out, of, uh, out of Jesus. And I know, I know that the, the passage says here, it says like great drops of blood. But I also know that there is a medical term called hematodrosis. Hematodrosis. And what that is, is, is that your, your little blood vessels around your pores, it is possible to be under such stress and such anguish that those little blood vessels will break. And all of a sudden, mixed with your sweat, is great drops of blood. Hematidrosis is what it's called. To me, as I was looking at this and I was researching this, the amazing thing to me, you know what causes it? Fight, flight or fight. That's what causes it. Anxiety, tremendous pressure causes those little blood vessels to rupture. And if you think about the pressure that Jesus was under, 
He knew what was going to happen to him. He was going to bear the sins of the world. That's why he was in Jerusalem. Uh, he, he had never sinned in his life, but now he was going to become sin. And he says, I'm at the point of death. And I think he meant that literally. Dr. Luke, thank you, Dr. Luke. He gives, it, he gives us this information in Luke chapter 22 and verse 43. He says, an angel appeared to him and strengthened him. Now, wait a minute. This is the Son of God. And an angel appears to help him out? You bet. He needed it. He was at the point of death. He was about to die. An angel to strengthen him. Being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and the sweat like drop blood fall, fell to the ground. I, I mean, if nothing else, that just doesn't sound very healthy. But here's the clincher for me. In Hebrews chapter 5, the Hebrew writer gives us this insight. In verse 6, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries. When do you think that was? It had to be right here in the garden. Now, I know Jesus prayed a lot, but this is the one where he, he prayed fervently with great cries and tears. And he prayed to the one who could save him from what? From death. Point of death. And then he says, and he was heard. In other words, his prayer was answered. Now, it's my opinion that Jesus was dying in, the, in, in, in Gethsemane. You can debate that. We can debate that if you want. But it's my opinion that he was dying there. But here's my point. Jesus knew he couldn't die in the garden. Jesus knew that if he died in the garden before the cross, then the plan of God would not have worked. It would have fallen apart. If Jesus had died in the garden, we would still be lost in our sins. And so Jesus in the garden prayed, Father, save me from this point of death so I can make it to the cross and die for, say your name. I am telling you, God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, desired to die for you. And that's what God was presenting at this triumphal entry. He was presenting the Lamb of God, which could take away the sins of the world. Mark Lowry, a Christian comedian, observed that Mary's silence at the cross always amazed him. He said, if, if I were being crucified in the middle of town, my, my mom would have pitched a fit. But Mary never said a word. And Lowry wondered, wondered if maybe it made the difference for her was remembering back to those early years of Jesus' birth and his childhood. He said, I wonder when she held his little fingers, did she realize that those were the fingers that had scooped the oceans and formed the sea? He, he wrote, when she counted his toes and tickled his feet, his feet, did she realize that those feet had just walked on streets of gold and had been worshipped by angels? When she brushed his lips, did she realize that those were the lips that had spoken the world into existence? When Mary kissed her little baby, she wasn't just kissing another baby. She was kissing the face of God. Thirty-three years later, she was standing on a hillside watching blood pour from her, his veins, from the veins of her firstborn son, and she didn't open her mouth. What a great testimony to the fact that he wasn't just a great preacher or just a great prophet or just a great teacher. He was born, the, he was born of a virgin. He was the virgin-born Son of God. He was our Savior. And he didn't die. He didn't die just for us but he died for his own mother. The baby boy that she had delivered 33 years ago was now on a cross delivering her. What was the purpose of Palm Sunday? Jesus came in that city that day because he wanted to die for you. He wanted to die for us. God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. But there's another purpose for Palm Sunday, and that is Palm Sunday was to establish the communion of the King. Communion means fellowship. 
And communion speaks of trust. Jesus entered Jerusalem triumphantly. He had, he had cleansed the temple, driving out the money changers. He, he gave the greatest discourse on his second coming that week. He, he prepared the disciples for his coming death and resurrection. In John's gospel, he taught them the comforting message of the coming Holy Spirit. And he didn't say it. But he did say it. Do you trust me? And then Passover came. And as evening came, they gathered in the upper room around the table, and the disciples had prepared the Passover meal at Jesus' instructions. And as they ate the supper, Jesus predicted his betrayal by Judas Iscariot. And Judas betrayed him and takes his leave. And then Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, we read, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. For the forgiveness of sins, I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from, from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And later, Paul quoting Jesus' words concerning communion, he said, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then the New Testament is very careful to record how the early believers celebrated communion to remember the importance of the blood of Jesus Christ and the body of their Lord. It, it, he didn't tell us how often we should celebrate it, but he did tell us the importance of remembering the true meaning of communion. And I wish we had time to talk about the true meaning of communion. Maybe we'll do that one day. But what it means is, is that we are part of a new covenant a new covenant because of the shed blood of Jesus' blood. Communion reminds us of Him. It speaks of our trust in Him, and it reminds us of the fellowship that we have. You know, when I think about the, the communion, the open communion, the open fellowship that we can have with God, I th often think of Adam and Eve. I mean, can you imagine what it's like to be in the presence of God? to wake up in the morning and hear the voice of God coming towards you, to be in that, in that paradise and sit face to face with your Creator to talk and to hear the voice of God. Wow, what, what, what perfection. You know, Adam and Eve actually were living the kind of life that, that people only dream about. Uh, you know, in fact, I, I think it's kind of a, a dream life that makes things like deal or no deal so popular. You remember that? Now all of a sudden we've got deal or no deal island or whatever. We watched a half an episode and that's all we could stomach. But in case you, in case you haven't seen it, deal or no deal, they have 26 state suitcases on a stage. The contestant must choose the one they think is worth a million dollars and then there's this kind of suspense as they pick from suitcases one by one to eliminate them, hoping for the best. Well, Adam and Eve had the deal or no deal set up with a twist. Now picture this, you're playing the Garden of Eden game show, deal or no deal, now work with me here, in the Garden of Eden, this game show, and all the suitcases there, 26 of them, every one of them have a million dollars in them except one. And not only that, but the game show host calls you aside and gives you some inside information. He tells you, you can pick any of the suitcases and you're going to win, but don't pick number 26. You pick number 26 and that'll wipe you out, that'll wipe your winnings out, and the game will be over for you. What a setup. Only one wrong suitcase and the host tells you which one it is. You can't lose, right? Well, that's the way it seemed when God told Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden, except I'm going to tell you which one not to eat from. And if, if there's only one, only one, wrong choice you can make, and the host tells you which one is the wrong case, don't choose that one. There's only one reason why you'd lose. You don't trust the host. You don't trust the host. And that's the tragedy of Adam and Eve. You see, there was nothing special about the tree. There was nothing special about the fruit. It wasn't poisonous. It wasn't magical. 
But the act of eating, eating it showed that way down in the deepest parts of their heart, they didn't trust their creator and how that must have broken the heart of God. See, good relationships are funny things. And for many, there are a lot of things that make, uh, that, that make relationships fun. But there's one element that limits the fun, and that's the element of trust. Without trust in a relationship, all you have is mere acquaintance. But with trust, the depth of fellowship is limitless. And so in communion, in the Lord's Supper, it is God saying to us, I forgive you for not trusting me. And in the communion service, as we partake of the emblems, it's us saying to God, okay, I will trust you. I trust you. I trust that your blood covers my sins and makes me whole again. I trust that your broken body means one day you will give me a body that will never break. You see, what's the purpose of Palm Sunday? I think it's simply this. It's God asking the world, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And that's the purpose. Well, there's one final thing I would say about Palm Sunday, and that is it's the conquest of the king. Again, in Matthew 21, he says, from that time Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed on the third day and rise to life. Jesus made it abundantly clear that he would die upon the cross, but that he would rise from the grave. Say that again. He made it abundantly clear that he was going to be killed, but he was going to be resurrected too. And they missed it. They missed it because they missed Jesus. You know, I've often looked at that tomb, the supposed tomb in the garden there in Jerusalem where, where Jesus was, was buried. I've, I've looked at it, I've studied, I've read books about it. Jesus promised that he would raise from the grave. And guess what? He did. He did. This is the foundation of our belief. His resurrection proves that not only did he die on the cross for our sins, but that he lives forever. Without the resurrection, Christianity is just like any other religion. I mean, if, if Jesus is still in the grave, then our faith is no different than any other faith. But because he is alive, our, it sets us apart from everybody else. Only Christians can say that their founder, their leader, is not in a tomb, but lives forevermore. Buddha, you can go to his grave. Can't get inside, but you can go to his grave. Confucius, or, uh, uh, Confucius Muhammad, you can go to their grave. Can't get inside, but you can go to their grave. But Jesus buried, on the, buried in the tomb. On the third day, he rises again from death, victorious over death, the hell, and grave, and the grave. This is the conquest. This is what he wrote in Jerusalem that day to do. And they missed it. They missed it because they missed him. When he died on the cross, hell had a holiday. When he said, it is finished, demon, da demons danced. But he, when he rose from the dead, horror must have filled their hearts because it meant they were defeated forever. It meant that they were doomed to a place called hell forever. Jesus is the master. He is the hero. He is the warrior of warrior, the king of kings, and his resurrection guarantees that. But on this day, on this day, they missed it because they missed him. And I wonder today, have you missed it? Because you've missed him. Luke chapter 19, verse 41 says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept. Why did he weep? This was a victorious, this was going to be a joyous celebration. Why did Jesus weep? Because he knew that they had missed it. If you, even you, had only known on this your day what would bring you peace, but you missed it. You missed it, and now it's hidden from you forever. Here was their king. Here was their Messiah. Here was the answer to their problems, their, their life's most difficulties. Here was their answer. Here was their sin bear. Here was their only hope. It was their day. And they missed it because they missed him. Here was their opportunity to anoint 
him their king. Here was the opportunity to say, Jesus, you are the king of my you are the king of kings, you are my kings, and I bow my knee to you. Here's their opportunity to accept his substitutionary death. Here's their opportunity to announce their trust in him. Here is their opportunity to affix themselves to Jesus. It was their day, but they missed it. Their eyes were full of the world, full of self, full of the earth good, so full, in fact, that they didn't see Jesus. They missed him. And I will tell you this this morning, if you miss him, forget about life, forget about victory. Anything you might accumulate in this world has little significance if you miss him. If you had known, especially you on this your day, but they missed him. This was our day. Today, in this place, this might be your day. This might be your day. For somebody here, it might be your day to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It might be your opportunity to acknowledge your trust in him. It might be your opportunity if you don't miss him. The donkey awkward, his mind still savoring the afterglow of the most exciting day of his life. Never before had he felt the rush of pleasure and pride. He walked into town and found a group of people at the well. I'll show myself to them, he thought. But they didn't notice. They went on drawing their water. They paid little attention to the little donkey. Throw your garments down, he said crossly. Don't you know who I am? They just looked at him in amazement. Someone slapped him across the hind end, ordered him to move on. Miserable heathens, he muttered to himself. I'll take myself down to the market where the good people are. They'll remember me. But the same thing happened there. No one paid any attention to the donkey as he strutted down the main street in front of the marketplace. The palm branches! Where are the palm branches? He shouted. Yesterday, you threw palm branches down for me. Hurt and confused, the donkey returned home to his mother. Foolish child, she said gently, don't you realize that without him, you're just an ordinary donkey? And don't you realize that without him, You're nothing but dirt. Nothing, you have no hope, you have no future. Are you here today enjoying the worship? Are you here today glad in the fellowship? Are you here today inspired by the music but missing Jesus? Satisfied that you took time out of your busy schedule to come to church and all the while you're missing the main thing, which is Jesus. Don't come here and miss him. Open up your eyes. See what's happening. Open up your heart and accept him today. We're going to sing an invitation hymn this morning, page number 597. Take my life and let it be. See, that's what, that's what we're inviting you to do. Lord, take my life. Take my life. Do with it what you will. Do with it what you please. Let's stand and sing the first and last verse of page 90, 597. If you have a decision to make, we invite you to come as we sing. good to have you with us this week. Uh, On the front of your bulletin, you'll notice uh, the numbers and the uh, email addresses and different things of myself, Josh, the elders, others are on there. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I know it's there. 
Um, you know, we offer these invitation hymns because it's the right thing to do, and, and we're going to do it, and we're always going to do it, but this isn't the only time that's acceptable for you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And so we put our numbers and we put our information on the front of the bulletin so that you at any moment can call one of us up and say, listen, I've got to get something taken care of. We'll meet you down here. We'll meet you at your home. We'll do whatever we can do to help you get right with God because that's our purpose and that's what we need to do. So don't think that when the invitation hymn is over that the invitation is over because it's not. It's always open. So I want, just wanted to make sure you understood that. Also, uh, just want to reemphasize what Josh said. Tomorrow morning, the men will meet for our Bible study. So I don't know if it was in the bulletin, but we will meet. Because uh, we have nothing, nothing better to do, okay? So we will meet tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. So if you're, if you're not working, come and join us. It's always a good time of fellowship and learning. So let me go ahead and pray, and we'll dismiss. Greet one another as we do that. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this place, to worship you, to acknowledge you as who you are, to bow our knee to you, to listen to your son. We thank you, Father, for this privilege and opportunity. I pray, Father, that you'd just be with those who are here, that you will help them in the dealings with their lives, the struggles that they go through, the things that they are facing in life. I pray, Father, that you would be there for them, to strengthen them, to aid them, to help them through those difficult times. Father, we just thank you and we love you and thank you for the salvation that you've brought us. And, and indeed, that's really what, what is important here, that we are right with you. And so, Father, help us to see that that's done. We pray now that you would dismiss us and go with us. And we thank you for this through Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.